to Subtext and Discourse, a podcast featuring conversations with a range of art world participants who share their unique experiences and insights to this famously opaque field. My name is Michael Dooney, director of Jarvis Dooney Gallery and host of the show. In today's episode, I'm speaking with Dr. Susan Bright. Susan is an Australian British curator currently based in London. She has a specialisation in lens based arts and contemporary visual culture with an emphasis on cross disciplinary and international programming. She was a curator at the National Portrait Gallery in London before deciding to work independently in the early 2000s. Her professional life has brought her to live in London, New York, and Paris, where she has worked with many institutions on a wide range of projects. These include Tate, Barbican, the Royal Academy, the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago, St. Louis Museum of Art, Phoenix Art Museum, and the New York Public Library. We spoke about Susan's career path to becoming a curator, the emergence of contemporary photography as we know it today, the positive impact of the Me Too movement in the photography scene, as well as how her two most personal projects, Motherhood and Feast, influence her approach to curating. I really enjoyed speaking with Susan, and I'm sure you'll appreciate the many insights that she shares. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. Susan Bright. It was funny when you, you brought me in and then you said, oh, I've never met another Perth person. So even coming from Perth, I'd like to decide, oh, I'll move to the other side of the world or I'll, I'll well, become a curator. Okay. A long space of time divided those two decisions. And the yeah. first decision was not mine. That was my parents. So okay. I, my parents emigrated in the 60s. They were the classic 10-pound poms. So they went to Australia on a boat with two toddlers, which to me is extraordinary because they wouldn't have seen any TV programs about Australia. They wouldn't have known what it even looked like. They went on a 20-minute promotional film, which the Australian Tourist Board or something maybe had sent out to populate with white middle-class people. That was their aim. So they just went and I was born very shortly after they arrived and lived there till I was nine, ten. And we came to Britain on a holiday, I remember. Didn't really like it. Yeah. Um, (laughs) And also Perth at that time was just full of Brits. It was, I think there was only one girl in my class who wasn't first generation Australian. Really? It was really like everyone was new. It was really weird. Yeah. I mean, look, think. I mean, didn't... I'm first generation. My parents are also British. Yeah. But they um, went in the 70s. They went in 75. To right. Birth. Okay. So, yeah, it's a weird place. And then they decided to travel overland back to Britain. So, what, we... like up through India? Oh, and... India, yeah. So, we, we were all vaccinated <laughs> and, <laughs> and we traveled. And so, that was a kind of crazy but wonderful kind of moment of my life which was as a like nine-year-old yeah very free range we did no school we did a bit of maths on a boat I remember there was boats a lot of boats involved and then we got to Britain and it was kind of like miserable and I think none of the three of us none of us ever felt truly British none of us kind of felt oh this is this is wonderful we all had that slight outsider status and we still do. And, and that's where I feel comfortable. I'm not quite this. I'm not quite that. And you can shape shift a little easier. And yeah. having travelled a lot as an adult and lived in other countries, you realise that, yeah, that's, that's my comfort zone is not being of that place or quite yeah. of the culture. Yeah, okay. But then, so if I understand right, you were a teenager whilst you were in London or in the UK? No, I grew up in Sussex. I grew up in the countryside. Yeah. So, yeah, complete country girl. And I'm really glad I grew up in Britain, actually, in the 80s. It was a really great time. Music was super important to me. That whole kind of music culture was it was so linked with visual culture, actually. Yeah. You couldn't separate them. Now they seem to me very separate, but we only found out about our music by magazines. Yeah, so, yeah. And then the video. So it was really, really linked with, with visual culture. So for me, those two were... We're inseparable in the same way with fashion. It was mm-hmm. so intertwined. And that has always fascinated me, that combination. So I'm really pleased I grew up in the 80s and, and early 90s and was formed by that music culture. That was very cool. You know, I, I'm glad I was part of that. Yeah, um, no, was a, I think it, when people look back at different times, like that was sort of quite a pivotal period, I think. Yeah, completely. And then I kind of got the beginning of rave culture, which I wholeheartedly embraced. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I just felt I lived, I mean, I think everyone lives because I lived through a moment, but I do feel that I lived through a good one. Yeah. 
So I was pleased to be in Britain and in Europe for that. Then I went to university in Leicester. So I didn't get to London until I was in my 20s. I lived here very briefly, but then went to live in Mongolia. Really? Which, wow. <laughs> yeah, which was a bit of a step, I guess. I mean, that is a proper contrast. I yeah. I don't know why you think even coming from Australia to Europe, it's different, but it's not that different. Yeah. No, this one was, I, I wanted to travel after university and I couldn't afford it. So I thought, well, how can I get somewhere that just isn't, you know, Britain? And so I did VSO, which is called Voluntary Services Overseas, which is like the American equivalent is Peace Corps. So I went to teach English and they said to me, I remember, we have sort of had a kind of series of interviews. Would you like to go to Mongolia? And I didn't yeah. really know where it was. I said, hang on. <laughs> so I had to look at a map and I looked at the map and saw it squashed in there between Russia and China. And I was like, Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because this is a place which I'm probably never going to go to. Mm. This was 94, so the fall of the Soviet Union. It was just getting its independence. It just seemed like such an opportunity. Absolutely. And so I was like, yes, absolutely. And there were eight of us that went. And at that time, I mean, it was extraordinary because there were, I think there were only 60 non-Mongolian people living there. I mean, there's only 2 million people in a country the size of Europe. I mean, it's it's not yeah. not a busy place. <laughs> yeah. And I spent two years there. So that was amazing. Yeah. And then how did that, I suppose, change your approach for moving forward to do like... Yeah, I did art history. And then I went and taught English. And then I came back to London. I met my husband there. We both came back to London. In Mongolia? Yeah. Wow. He's, he's not from London. So he moved to London. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was in my mid-twenties, really mm. rudderless. And still thinking I'd probably work in the arts, but I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what that was. I don't come from an arty family. I couldn't get my head around about how you would ever go to work in a museum or a commercial gallery, or mm. I had no contacts. Because at the time it was, I'm also trying to think about now the concept or the idea of that style of work, because the word curator is such a part of our vernacular Yeah, now. but it really wasn't then. So I thought, right, I'll go and do a master's because mm. it's a commitment to the subject. I always feel master's is like if you were doing accounting, you'd go and do those accounting exams. Mm. Or a doctor, you know, you'd carry on doing exams. But there isn't anything for like that in the arts. Mm. But I thought if I do a master's, it shows I'm committed. Also, I love school. I really yeah. love learning. <laughs> so I thought, all right, I'll go and do that. And I went to Goldsmiths and I really wanted to go to Goldsmiths. I didn't want to go anywhere else. I, again, I don't know why. I often just kind of follow my gut on things. I did critical theory, which is the most useless <laughs> masters you could possibly do because you just spend a year looking at Derrida and Kant and I, just, I still don't know what to do. I still don't know what to do. And I'm really unqualified, actually. Yeah. I have no practical anything. So I kind of came out thinking I was very clever. And I wrote to every single museum and every single gallery in London. And at the, that point, there were about 70 of them. So commercial galleries, public galleries, museums, and said, oh, this is me, please give me a job. <laughs> Not knowing that you don't do that. Yeah. So one person wrote back saying, you you don't do that. You have to be an intern. Oh, okay. And I was like, oh, okay. Can I be an intern? Can I be an intern? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And she was, uh, she's a curator at the Chisholm Gallery. She wrote, yeah, sure, you can come be an intern. And the only other person that wrote back was Mark Howard Booth, who was then curator of photographs at the V&A. Wow. Okay. So a bit of a leap as to why I even wrote to him. Again, it's one of those gut things. I picked up his book in Dylan's art bookshop and I loved I loved the cover and I started to read it in the bookshop and he writes so beautifully. And it was personal story of his life as a curator, the collection and a history of the museum and a history of photography. Wow. Okay. But it was just done in such a lyrical way. I literally kind of sat and read the book in the bookshop and I just thought, I, I want to be like him. And I wrote to him and one of the curators wrote back and said, yes, you can be an intern. So I started to intern simultaneously at the Chisholm Gallery and in the photographs collection. I didn't until recently kind of have a notion as to why I was interested in photography. It mm. was more him. But actually when I got there 
and I was learning through going through the stacks. I was learning from objects. I was yeah. learning the history of photography, which I'd never looked at in any of my art education. At all? At all. Yeah, wow. Because it wasn't art then. That's true, yeah. It goes back to being into music and that visual culture that I had collected magazines and records and postcards and they were all yeah. photographs. Yeah. And it, I, it felt that it legitimised my kind of teenage passions. I thought, God, I can have a job but looking at, you know, pictures of supermodels. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so simultaneously jobs came up, one at the Chisholm and one at the National Portrait Gallery. And I was like, okay, this is one of those sliding doors moments. Yeah. I can either go and work in a museum or I can go and work with contemporary art. And I chose the museum. So went to work as an assistant curator of photographs at the National Portrait Gallery. So age 26, so old to be getting my first job. Mm, you know, yeah. With actually no experience. No experience, yeah. Absolutely no experience, like six months interning. And I think I got the job because I was the least qualified. <laughs> <laughs> I genuinely believe that because I know other people that went for that job. One had a PhD, another one was had worked in Bradford, and I genuinely think it was because the curator felt that he could. Oh, you were the most malleable. Maybe. Exactly. Yeah. That he obviously <laughs> didn't know anything about me, and so that's kind of the quick story of how I got into photography mm -hmm. and working as a curator. Yeah. Wow. So uh, seeing as photography was maybe only becoming accepted. Like you were there at that point when those opportunities were becoming available, really? Yes, sort of end of the 90s, I guess. And that was that whole boom of art photography becoming a thing. So Gursky, all those guys, mm. all the work from Germany was becoming very fashionable. It's being collected by museums. The MPG were different in this respect because they had always collected photography. They have an amazing collection. And it was, again, a real fast track of learning, especially 19th century processes, because I wouldn't know what a Woodbury type was. Now I do. I can recognize them. And it was all, again, learning through objects. All my kind of photography education was object based. And I, I think I'm so lucky for that. So it was a really thrilling time. Also, the book market for Iden was really exciting at that time. It's taking off. They were beginning to do good photo books. And using the people who had worked in the cookbook section. So they were making them to look cook, you know, the photo people were making cookbooks to look like photo books, and the photo book people were making oh, okay. amazing books that were kind of coming from the cookbook. And it was all intertwined. Wow, and, okay. and I remember I was equally interested in like the Nigel Slater book was, and the River Cafe flicking through these, going, these look good. I don't know why. And then now, and it was only years later when I was doing Feast that I learned that there was that kind of hybrid between the two mm -hmm. people at Fiden. So I've always been interested in all types of photography. I think that's kind of come across. I'm not a kind of connoisseur. Yeah. I'm not a fetishist. I, I think it's equally exciting to look at a cookbook than it is a beautiful photo book. I kind of can't see the difference in a way. Yeah. Well, I suppose both of them are about visually communicating yeah completely something. and i think that's my interest in photography as well it's not mm -hmm. just beautiful fine art prints that's hang in a gallery it's about how they communicate in the world yeah because i noticed that i think looking through some of the big shows that you've curated and even with some of your writing it is looking at photography but it's almost like looking at history through photography yeah and different like cultural movements and different kind of aspects of society and life I guess photography, in a sense, is a nice document of that because you literally have a record of those things as they were happening. Yeah, I think it's really an astute way of how I work. So I'm not, you know, people go, oh, when did you get into photography? I'm not really into photography. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm into are, you know, yeah, exactly, the culture that surrounds it and it's just a way in. It could be literature. I'm equally interested in literature. Mm -hmm. It just happens that I've kind of got more experience and more knowledge of photography but yeah, so that's my relationship to it and my way into curating and writing about it. Yeah. And I feel like from quite an early point, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you decided rather than being committed to an institute or to one organisation that you sort of made the conscious decision to say, no, I want to be an independent curator. And 
I kind of want to have control over what I do. Yeah. I mean, that was a crazy decision. So from the National Portrait Gallery, I then went to work for an organization called the Association of Photographers, which is a not-for-profit trade organization for commercial photographers. Because I wanted to work faster, museums' wheels turn really slowly. Yeah. And the curator at that time was in his 50s. He wasn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And it suddenly dawned on me that I wasn't going to be able to do a big exhibition. It's, it's just not an environment where I was really ambitious, where I could do what I wanted to do. So the AOP actually was better. It was faster. I learned such a huge amount. I learned how to do spreadsheets. I learned all those kind of very useful things, which you don't learn in a museum at a very low level, no. which I was. But again, just frustrated. I'm just really frustrated because I couldn't do what, you know, the constraints of that organization wouldn't allow me to do what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I decided, I think it was 2002, to go freelance. Mm -hmm. Crazy decision. There wasn't really a freelance culture of curating at that time. Val Williams was a freelance curator. She was the only one I knew. Yeah. And she was, you know, older than me and you know, was associated with tertiary education and, you know, ha had these kind of anchors in various places. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any of that. And I remember doing a spreadsheet because I could do them now, um, <laughs> saying, right, if I wrote a review, I would get £70, rent 700 yeah. <laughs> And I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, how am I going to ever make that align? And yeah. that has actually been a struggle my whole career. Yeah. And so I just, I just dived in. I just started writing. I'd ha I had been writing reviews. I actually wrote a review in Mongolia and I've been writing for Art Asian News. So I, I had been writing a little mm. bit, but so I thought, right, I've got to really pump that up. Yeah, I've got to teach to have some kind of regular income and figure out a way that I can curate. And, you know, it just kind of worked out. Yeah, I wow. I mean, it, it, very soon I got a very large... So 2000 and five so three years afterwards i was asked to do a big survey show at tate britain mm -hmm. of british photography with val williams oh okay so yeah. you know it just worked out it was a lot of stars aligning hard hard work a lot of self-promotion yeah. <laughs> in a time where you couldn't really there was no social media well, social as such. Media didn't exist no. yet did it no yeah i think it was just you know just really hard work yeah because you're also Parallel to all this, you're also writing or co-authoring a book every couple of years, aren't you? Yeah, so I was doing around that time Art Photography Now, which was my first book, which was a survey of, of the clues in the title. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, survey of art photography at the time. This, again, it's kind of hard to think back because the same year, one by Charlotte Cotton, one by David Campany and mine, we all, they all came out at the same time. And there hadn't been a kind of overview of contemporary photography before that. So it yeah. was a moment, you know, again, these are kind of moments. So that I think those books kind of launched all of us a bit into, OK, this is our territory. It feels like the kind of the ephemeral nature of an exhibition and bringing lots of different elements together, that you quite enjoy that more than... yeah putting a book together yeah no no definitely i really f love exhibition making i love curating i love thinking through an idea in a physical space for me that i feel is where my i'm stronger i understand it better i understand i you know you almost go into a kind of trance in a way of imagining that in a big physical thing and the size of the prints and the visitor experience and walking around and getting that very physical feeling that you get from an exhibition yeah i really love the exhibition space much more than i love a book and just being in amongst that but sometimes a book is what is needed like with yeah. feast a book was needed an exhibition came later that history needed to be written as a history so sometimes the book is the best way to translate my ideas and sometimes it's an exhibition it's just a bit annoying when it's a book because it's like oh, damn it i've got to write it <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather somebody else wrote it and I could read it, but nobody yeah. kind of does. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to yeah, do yeah. the things that I'm really passionate about. So it's like, okay, I've got to do that. So at the moment, I'm, I'm working on exhibitions, not books. So that feels good. Yeah, oh, that must be nice. Yeah. So 
keeping in thinking now about the chronology of everything. So this was around 2005. And when I arrived before, you said you'd only just moved back to London. So you were in Paris prior yeah. to that and New York prior to that. Yeah. So when you'd written Art Photography Now, so were you I'd, still in the UK? Or? Yeah, I'd written Art Photography Now, the Tate Show. I was living in London simultaneously to the Tate Show. This is another thing that happens in my life. was a big fashion show at the National Portrait Gallery. I tend to kind of, my life is feast or famine. And things tend to all happen at once and then it's a bit quiet and I sit and write and then everything happens again. So 2007 was a really big year. Mm -hmm. After we now came out in 2006, I think, the Tate show, the MPG show, I was doing a show in Oslo as well about sculpture and photography, which at that time was really unusual and and different and a few artists were kind of working sculpturally in in 3d now it's so normal you Mm. know so i was trying to get my head around that as well and like why are photographers doing this so that show i got pregnant (laughs) got married yeah (laughs) moved to new york so it was nuts it was a nutty year and so I kind of arrived in New York and slept until my baby was born. <laughs> and, and then and life changes. Yeah. So, yeah, we moved to New York because of my husband's job. Okay. But I'd always wanted to. Everyone wants to live in New York. It was always a dream. It was yeah. a complete, like, okay, let's go. It was very kind of quick. And, you know, we all we went there and landed. And, you mm-hmm. know, it was just kind of chaotic and wonderful. And we ended up living there for eight years. Wow. And so, how did that then impact your... Because you were quite established in London, yeah, like yeah, quite yeah. a figure. With and, what you but were also doing. very keen to get out because it was just like, what do you do after Tate? You know, it's like, yeah, oh, guess, yeah, yeah. It, it's really tight, the photo world here. And everyone was kind of looking at me going, what next? I'm like, whoa, yeah, yeah. I'm out of here. So it was a bit of relief, to be honest. You know, and the world continues and the London photo scene continues to, to flourish and it yeah. didn't even me there. So it was... But for you, sorry, like even thinking... When I leave, will people be like, oh, well, we've got new people now? And then yeah, just... of course they will. Everyone's yeah. replaceable, yeah. But that was ever, never a concern? You were never worried that, oh, what's going to happen? No, it doesn't, you no. know, no. It's a good attitude to yeah, have. Not many people can feel that it. way. And you've got to have it. And, and also I was going, going to New York. So was, yeah, exactly. Yeah, was, it's like, oh, whatever. London, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was like, oh, my God, this is going to be amazing. And I was pregnant. You know, it was just a different stage of my mm, life. It was yes. just like, okay, I've done that. I'm moving on. And I do feel my life does fall into quite concise boxes. So, yeah, yes. Yeah. So what I was working on autofocus. So it was, I was working on a book. Mm. So it wasn't like I went there and I had no work. I was, yeah. I was writing this book. And then I had my baby and I thought, mm. and I started to read a lot about motherhood. Mm. And very soon I knew that I wanted to do some kind of project around motherhood i didn't really know what that was and then i thought actually i know this is going to take it's really complex it's a really big subject i don't know my way in if i'm going to do this i need some kind of anchor you Mm. know whether that's a university or a museum or something i can't just sit there flailing around researching on my own so I, i signed up for my phd Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and that was at Goldsmiths. I'm very fond of Goldsmiths. <laughs> and I could work from New York. So pretty soon after I moved to New York, I started my PhD. Mm-hmm. So New York is, for me, is kind of PhD, home truths, mm-hmm. finishing autofocus, that stage of my life. That was eight years. So yeah, wow. It's slow, you know, having a child slows you down. Yeah. And um, I want to. I've learned. Yeah. (laughs) And you just can't do as much as you did before. In London, I was working like a demon. And in New York, I wasn't. I was still really busy and really tired. I was just busy elsewhere, you know. And uh, that was great, actually. It was really what was needed. Mm -hmm. Like through that project, through the motherhood project, would you say that was different from some of the other shows you had curated because you were more let's say, emotionally and personally connected to the yeah, subject Yeah, completely. Matter. And that was a real revelation to me. It was like, when I was teaching, I also taught a lot in mm-hmm. New York. When I am teaching, I always said to my students, you know, do something you care about. Yeah. But I hadn't been doing that in my own practice. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. do I really care about, you know, the- yes, I care about these things that I had mm-hmm. worked on, but that I didn't have any kind of personal attachment to them. And then the motherhood, again, it's that feeling of being legitimate. You know, as a curator, you're told you have to be very objective. And I actually don't think that's true. I think subjectivity is really complex, really interesting, and it should be in the mix. Yeah. Well, I think as well, you need to bring something to it as a person, I think. Yeah, but for me, yes. Yeah. And I hadn't really done that before. 
it really made that project very important to me. It's still mm. the project that I I cherish the most along with Feast. It's these two are the ones that I felt I've put my blood and guts into. Yeah. And I think are the most successful and the most complex as well. Yeah. What would you say are some of the maybe insights or revelations you discovered doing the motherhood project? Because if I reflect on my own, like, okay, I'm a father, so it's different. The project's motherhood. It's not being a parent. It's being a mother. Specifically on motherhood, yeah. It was motherhood for a very specific reason, was that one art historically, that Madonna figure goes all the way back. You know, when we look at Madonna, when Joseph's nowhere to be seen, Mm -hmm. there isn't a history of representation to work against, to to figure out, to to wrap your head around. That just isn't there. And what I discovered was in this looking back over the art history, there is the, the you know, you're demonized. You, you're doomed if you do, you're doomed if you don't. Mm. You know, you're a Madonna or you're a whore. And these binaries reverberate throughout the history of art. And it was those opposites. It was those kind of magnets that seemed to kind of be so key to motherhood to me. You are overwhelmed with everything but yet you're, you're losing something all the time you're losing your own identity as as a non-mother mm-hmm. you're losing as soon as you give birth your your job is to give that child away i mean it's just it's so <laughs> it's so cutting you know you're you to do a good job you have to let her go and so it was this idea of too much and and loss so loss and abundance on both sides which was the kind of theoretical underpinning. It was my feeling. It was, you know, in psychoanalysis, it's talked about all the time. It's So the whole project was about this idea of of loss and abundance. And also that tied in with photography as well, mm. which seemed to me so key to it all, was that you've we've kind of got this glut of digital culture, mm-hmm. but yet we're losing so much of photography as well, the album and the print. And yeah. so those kind of similarities. So that was what the PhD was about. It was making a connection between photography and motherhood as a way of understanding photography. Yeah. I suppose then through that, had you seen then like changes through, because photography compared to the rest of kind of art is still relatively young. And I feel like a lot of the time there are more people that maybe would have been excluded from painting and sculpture because it doesn't have the same scholarship and pedigree for entry. Like you could get a camera when you, yeah, as a child in the 70s and the 80s. And there are more, let's say there's more diversity of voices. When you were putting everything together for the exhibition, did you sort of notice different shifts or different points of view coming in at certain points yeah, in time? Yeah, tons, tons. I had a quite specific take on it. Mm-hmm. I remember my first proposal that I did, you know, it kind of encompassed everything, yeah. you know, and then and then there was a section at the end which was all the stuff that didn't quite fit into the other sections. And mm-hmm. I remember my supervisor saying, actually, that's your exhibition. That's the ambivalence that you're talking about. It's not pregnancy. It's not... Nursing. Forget all those. Some of that will come into this kind of sticky area that you're interested in. So yeah, and a lot of work. I also realised that because I was reading a lot, and I was like, I wonder what photography. I wonder what's being done in photography. And I realised there was a ton being done. It's often not it, at that time. This is pre Me Too. A big shift happened after yeah. Me Too. A lot of that stuff didn't get out there. Yeah. Because it was people saw it as women's work or not interesting. Yeah, and and I guess that's maybe another question that I have for it is that through my own journey becoming a parent, there's so much information. It's like how come nobody's told us any of this? Yeah, like, there's so much that's just either not available, not spoken about, or just somehow not important. But it affects so many. It affects yeah. all of us. No, it's a mystery, and and, and menopause is another one. You yeah. know, <laughs> it's just like wow, this was nobody was talking about this. And parenthood was absolutely that. It was just like, why didn't I? I think it's changed. I really yeah. do genuinely. I mean, but you've just had yours, so maybe it hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I felt very in the dark. And had I known, had I seen pictures, mm-hmm. I would have known that actually your belly doesn't go down the next day. It hangs around. Yeah. But you think that you have a baby and then your stomach disappears. And and there was that picture Yeah, and then the next of, week I'm back to work and everything's yeah, great. Yeah, I can and, go running again. And I remember there was a picture of uh, Kate, William's wife, after she'd given birth and she had this big belly and there was kind of an uproar about it. And then I was like, well, that's because pregnant women have been photographed head up on yeah. the whole after they've just given birth. They're photographed holding their baby so mm. you just see the top 
of them. You don't see their bellies, just not photographed. So how can you know about something if you've never seen it? Yeah. You know, so there was tons of and tons of things like that, which I learned through photography. And that's what I wanted to put into the show. I wanted to show the kind of reality of it a bit more. Yeah. I guess since your massive project... Have you seen much of a shift in general or have you seen more of that kind of work? Yeah, definitely. So that was 2013 that it was first shown. So again, it's a while ago. Mm -hmm. And I think since then, a younger generation of women don't hide their pregnancies. They wear their motherhood with much more of a badge of pride. It's mm -hmm. not, I know women my age, I go, God, you've got kids. I didn't know that. You yeah. Know? But women who are having kids now, you know, that they're all putting them on Instagram, you know, as you know, we all know their mothers and it's yeah. part of their identity and that's really healthy. That's a real shift. I've absolutely noticed that. I've noticed there's a lot more shows about motherhood. So when I did was doing my PhD, I was, you know, obviously historically traced those shows mm -hmm. and they tended to be not very many and quite celebrationary. Yeah. But that's changed. There's a great show that was just on uh, in Denmark in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. great show on motherhood really good work and it's like wow that's different you know it's not this kind of oh mothers are wonderful yeah it's none yeah. of that so yeah great a big shift great new books um it's become much more politicized and i think that is post me too i really do yeah, yeah i think i mean I didn't have any difficulty placing my show, but I've had a lot of, of curators saying I was doing a show on women's issues and people go, mm, any mothers will come. It's only interested women. It's a bit niche. I was yeah. like, <laughs> how can motherhood be niche? Yeah. Yeah. It suffers from being too much and too little. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And you couldn't say that post me too, mm -hmm. you know? that kind of language that kind of attitude is not acceptable anymore yeah. yeah so i did notice that within just female shows generally mm -hmm. things on motherhood books and shows much much more yeah wow if we take a sidestep from the the motherhood project yeah was feast after that yeah Fe so feast came after motherhood so i just been signed to do feast just as we were leaving america and that came about because from the Tate show way back, we had put in a good housekeeping book and I'd never looked, really looked at a cookbook, uh, social history. I'd always just really loved the, I cook a lot, so I have a lot of cookbooks. So I'd always looked at the photographs and the way they're put together, but I hadn't really thought of them as social history. Mm. And that, that good housekeeping book was super interesting because it was done just after the war it was getting women back into the kitchen again. It was very gendered in the text. And it had food that you couldn't get in Britain at the oh, time. Okay. Like getting a, you couldn't even really get an avocado in Britain until, you know, the nineties. <laughs> yeah, wow. So you certainly couldn't get red peppers. Uh you certainly couldn't get spices easily, but it had Ceylon curries. So it was mm. so it was about you know, it's about colonialism. It was about travel. It was about it just said so much. It was so rich. And I sort of tucked it away and thought, oh, I can't wait for somebody to write a book about that. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> then, <laughs> and then I was in the States and I met Denise Wolf, who is an editor at Aperture. And I started to talk about this book. Turns out she collects cookbooks from the 50s to the 70s, American cookbooks, for the very same reason, because also the photography is amazing. Yeah. And we were just like, whoa. And we, you know, it was that moment where people were backing away from us. And we knew we had to do this book. And I knew I wanted to work with her. And it was like the perfect marriage. Mm -hmm. So that was just as I was leaving New York. And it wasn't a huge, I don't think it's, everyone was like, motherhood to food, you know. And I was like, that's not a step. It's No, it's, it's not really. No, it's no. what you were saying. It's how I approach photography. It's yeah. not, the subject matter is you know, things that I'm interested in. The f photographs are how that, they resonate in the world. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so then when I moved to Paris, that was the bulk of my time in Paris was the book and the exhibition for Feast. Yeah. You know, as I say, I tend to work slowly mm -hmm. and I tend to work on sort of big projects yeah. one at a time. Well, I mean, if you're that thorough as well, you can't really do it quickly. Yeah, I mean, these are big, big research projects. They do take time. And, and Feast, that history hadn't been written. A lot mm -hmm. of it was commercial photography. Just takes a lot of time. Yeah. Well, with both projects, like it wasn't just, it wasn't a Western centric look at the subject matter. Like no, with... it probably is though, because that's where you can get the information. It's mm -hmm. probably more Western, mm -hmm. more sort of American and European than it should be. 
Yeah, but just due to the availability of the Yeah, subject absolutely. So what the exhibition allowed, so that was a book first and then an exhibition. And what the exhibition allowed us to do was actually find work from Africa. We managed to get some great kind of cookery cards from Ghana. My family is, live in South Africa, so I was able to bring in some of that material. So it was just, you know, it's such a vast area that to do it you know a whole th thing you would, it would take years and years and years so we were able to make it more diverse in the exhibition yeah how was the response to the first one amazing i mean amazing yeah. it traveled i think to seven different venues in europe and the americas the book sold really well so yeah so i love i love it it's it's a project i feel really proud of and i'm really fond of and I kind of look at it and, wow, I, found, I sound really happy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't always sound really happy in my books, but I sound really happy in that book. Yeah. Those ones I think you said before you'd written because nobody else had written them. You're like, nobody has done this, so I can't wait for someone else to do it. Yeah. I have to get out and do this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think there's still, just because there's one book on it, there's still room for other books about the history of styling and food or, you know, there's tons of ways through it. So, yes, I hope people do write more. And same with motherhood. You know, I'm glad that, that, you know. Well, hopefully it opens the door to other people to say, oh, I can do this as well. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. Because your last book then was about visual literacy, really. Yeah, wasn't it? that was, again, I sort of, I do tend to like to close moments of my life. Yeah. So I've been teaching for 15 years and I was teaching in Paris and I suddenly thought, you know what, I've been doing this for 15 years and I'm not learning anything mm -hmm. more from it. So it's time to stop. It's not fair on the students. It's mm -hmm. not fair on me. It's just not right for me to keep doing this. So the book, which I co-authored, I like to work with other people. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important. Yeah, though. yeah. And I think, I mean, when I've spoke with other people about it and for me, it's also interesting to hear it. But I think when you have two people come together you can create something that neither of you would have done yeah, completely. on your own. Yeah, completely. So. And, uh, you know, it's kind of lonely writing on your own. You know, it, I like to talk, yeah. <laughs> as you can see. So um, Hedy Van Erp, it was actually originally her idea and we wanted to do it for kids. And we could not get a publisher to take it. I mean, this was such a long time ago now. Yeah. And we schlepped it around and nobody took it. And eventually Tate took it and said, yeah, but for a general reader. And we were like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> we won't do it for kids. And it sort of marked a period of like, okay, this is everything I've taught is going into this book. So anyone who has been taught by me was like, oh, my God, she's still banging on about Queen Victoria. <laughs> she's still banging on about, you know, this and that. So what Hedy brought was – Again, like you said, stuff that work that I would never have brought in, a great writing style. You know, she's, I mean, she's a fantastic writer. So, yeah, it was both of us. And that kind of marked an end of like, okay, I've been carrying this knowledge around, this way of teaching, this way of thinking. And it is absolutely aimed at kind of undergrad, somebody who's not perhaps studied photography before, but wants to, wants to pick that up and just think through stuff that we go, oh, yeah. It was really hard to write because... Yeah. You had to go really back to basics. Yeah, and I suppose there's lots of things that become second nature yeah. to us. And then when you explain them to somebody else, you're like, "Yeah, how do you not know this? But it's Amazing. Yeah. I gave a talk the other day and the, and the person said, it was about feasts, they said, how, how can you make a picture look melancholy if it's not a person looking sad? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, that's such a good question. Yeah. And I was like, you really have no understanding of, you know, mood and context and all these things, which I, I didn't know how to answer her. It was only like two days later. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it's so obvious to me. So it was a, it was a really interesting book to write, both for Hedy and I, because we both worked in photography for 20 years. So. Yeah. And I think as well, I mean, I said it was second nature, but I think also, like, I know I've looked at a lot of photography it's probably like a drop in the ocean of how much photography and imagery that you've seen. And somehow we can just respond to things. We don't yeah, need yeah. to think about them anymore. It's just there's enough other information already in my kind of database of visual yeah. literacy that I can just tell, okay, this is however it is and I don't need to be conscious of it anymore. No, exactly. And I do. I mean, as you do, I have a kind of Rolodex. When I see a picture, I'm going to ch -ch -ch -ch, and I work my way back historically to kind of place it. And I just do that because I have that Rolodex. Yeah. 
But if you don't, you need other tools and other clues in able to, if you're looking at a Thomas Roof, you know, where do you start? You know, so the idea was, okay, where do you start? Here are some ideas of how you can start to think about that picture. Yeah. And that's what that book was about. It was like, okay, here you go. Here's just some ideas to get you going. And then you've got to trust your gut. You've got to trust your experience. You've got to trust your background and bring that to your reading as well and, and be secure. People get very shaky when they're talking about art because they're kind of getting it wrong. Yeah. But they can talk about music. Yeah, yeah, you know, So with my students, I was like, so my first lesson often with students is like, just bring in a track and talk yeah. about why you love it. And they will talk and talk and talk and talk. I was like, I bring in a photograph and they're like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because they're frightened they haven't got that language and they haven't got that language because they haven't been talking about it all their lives like they have mm. with music so it's just trying to make them relaxed enough to trust their intuition and to be able to have you know a few sources to pull on and to be able to articulate themselves yeah absolutely well i'll put a link to the book in the show notes because i think a lot of other photographers and people listening are probably like that's a book i need to read yeah <laughs> <laughs> I guess we're coming up to the end because we've almost been speaking for an hour. So I thought rather than talking about something else additionally photographic, you describe yourself as a runner and a swimmer. Yes. Or... <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, they're really important to me. They're yeah. really, really important to me. The running came about in Paris and I think it was, you know, coming up to 50 and I was mm. like, oh, my, my midlife crisis, what am I going to do? And said, right, I'm going to do a marathon. How, has you done any running before? Yeah, that? a tiny bit, but not much. A bit in New York, you know, because everyone runs in New York. So I'd run around Central Park, which was actually seven miles. So it's actually Whoa. quite a big run yeah. and quite hilly. I was very fit there, though. So it was like, oh, I'll just run around the park. And then I got to Paris. I was like, oh, my God, I'm really <laughs> unfit. And so I started really slowly and mm. really late in the game. I mm. kind of put it off for a while, but got really into it. And loved it. So ran four times a week, you know, yeah. I'd be doing long runs and the marathon was amazing. And I wrote about it. I yeah. wrote about it for the FT. So it was all, it's always connected. Everything's always connected. They're not separate for mm. me. And I don't meditate. And no? I think that... I find that running can be meditative. Yeah, that's my, that's the, yeah. you get into that. It's like a, it's not a shortcut because it actually can take quite a long time to get there. But there are moments where you're just in the yeah. zone. But you have to be running for a while. Yeah. I know when we trained for the marathon years ago, because we did the half marathon and we didn't train, which was, it was silly. But yeah. you can do a half marathon. Yeah, yeah, and not train. A full marathon, that we had to really, and I think we could have trained more. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. there were certainly times when you've been running for more than an hour and you forget where you are or what's yeah. happening and like you were in a different and you don't know how long that state's been that's what yeah. i was always from really frustrating it's like i wonder if it was just like two seconds or if it was like five minutes i don't yeah. know because it was really good <laughs> <laughs> I want to get back. so you're always kind of chasing that and i got to know paris really well i literally ran the city you know so i know paris super well from from doing that so i'm really happy about that so that was amazing and I've always swum being an Aussie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my, could be, and also being the youngest, you know, you would get very competitive. And I remember my parents saying, so I must be like six. They said, if you can swim the whole length of this pool, it's an Olympic sized pool, I just yeah. like to say, Aussie pools, without your floaties, you, you can, um, you know, you're allowed to swim without, mm. without them. <laughs> so I remember like, I did it. I was like almost dying. Yeah. You know? But I did it. So, and then I swam competitively as a teenager. So, swimming has always been kind of sewn in to who I am, but not cold swimming. The yeah. cold swimming is new. And that was when we moved to London. And I thought, I'm going to swim in seven time. And so I do. Yeah. So, I haven't swum this week, but I am swimming tomorrow at Hampstead. And I love it. Again, it's a meditation thing. Because how cold is the water? Oh, it's about, at the moment, it's about 10 degrees. So when you get out, it almost feels like I'm electric and my mind is completely like free, free. It's like I, you know, I've been dunked in something and it's a clean slate. And then I have a really cold shower outside. Yeah, I've been doing that for this since a year now. I did a, I did a nice bath at the beginning of this year. So this was in one of the rivers in Berlin and it must have only just been above freezing. Yeah. It was like, painful going in and yeah. I hadn't practiced I think now no, I do, you do, yeah you've got now to do I it do regularly cold showers all the time so yeah. I think I could 
are much better prepared. Whereas yeah. when I did it then, I had only done a little bit. No, and no, it's no. Just, you got to, yeah, you got to work up to it. And then I just feel amazing. I just yeah. feel amazing. By nine o'clock, I'm ready. I feel like I've been run over by a truck. I'm ready for bed. Mm -hmm. But it's that moment of like, whew, and I come back and I just work. You know, I can just, the concentration level is amazing. Yeah. So I'm not giving it up. So I still run a bit, but I'm, swimming is a bit more obsessional at the moment. So, yeah, and they're both super crucial. It's a couple of pieces I've written recently have been about water and about that idea of perseverance, repetition. So it all feeds in. I don't feel that anything is too random in my life. It, it, I'm always so one thing into another. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Susan Bright and the brief insight to her life and work. For the last 20 years, her books, exhibitions, writing and teaching have all made a significant contribution to the contemporary photography landscape. So I really appreciate it taking the time to speak with me on the podcast. As always, I've included links in the show notes to the myriad of things we spoke about, together with links to Susan's website and social media. If you have any questions or feedback to this or past episodes of the podcast, please feel free to get in touch. You can find Subtext and Discourse Art World Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and every major podcast platform. If someone you know would enjoy this episode, please feel free to send them a link. And if you're feeling generous, why not leave a rating and review of the show? That's all for now. Thanks again for tuning in. My name's Michael Dooney, and you've been listening to Subtext and Discourse.